blocks away the, the, the Watson building is from the Michael Press Center, but it was really memorable. So, uh, we want to welcome him tonight to talk about Watson products. Thank you. Um, I was going to address something that I heard earlier um, about SSDs and older Macintoshes. Be careful and beware about going out and buying that because some of the older Macintoshes can't go fast enough for the new SSDs. So you just be basically wasting your money. Uh, but they're not a bad idea. But don't expect that it's going to automatically be this twice as fast system because the, the, the system just won't go that fast. Um, to give you an idea, this is a one terabyte SSD, and I do all my Mojave development on this. It's quick. This guy boots right up. I run. Everything works. So let's get this show on the road here. Goggles out. Let's start this guy. So, how many of you guys have heard of Wacom? Oh, everybody. Look at that. That's good. <coughs> yeah. So, how far back do people go? How many people are in the industry? That's a, a couple. The, the, the software, hardware, computer industry. Okay, how long have you been in? Since uh, 1984. Okay, so you can remember the old days of, IBM used to have this thing called a light pin, and the thing weighed about five pounds. It was attached to a wire that you couldn't move, and you were afraid of smashing the CRT glass every time you got close with the thing. That's the first pen I ever used, and that's circa 1978-79. And those things were kind of the first pens out on the market, and they really did a lot. Not much development was happening with pens until something called the Macintosh came along and the desktop publishing revolution. And so that's really where the, the roots of where Wacom starts is, who knows about Xerox Park? Okay, so Xerox Park, a lot of wonderful. I did. Oops, sorry. Uh, Xerox Park came out with all this publishing uh, theory, I guess you would want to call it, interpress programs like that. And John Warnock and Chuck Geske split off and formed a company called Adobe. And the ability to output high quality graphic images really set in motion this whole change in the world. And there was this program called Adobe Illustrator that uh, allowed people to draw line art or vector graphics, if you will, and the mouse just wasn't cutting it anymore. And so people went on and, and voila, the folks at Wacom kind of said, hey, guess what? We can do a better job by building a sensor that allows you to use something close to a pen, like one of these. And I'll get into how these things work in a minute, but it was basically a way of inputting into the computer that didn't involve just a one button click, moving a mouse back and forth, uh, and, and a keyboard. This had something called pressure, so as you push on the pen, you could thicken the line or you can change the color gradients. There's all kinds of options you can set on, on how you want to use the pen. So it became very big in calligraphy, uh, became very big in line art, and that's really how the desktop publishing thing started. So it was founded in uh, Japan uh, by four gentlemen, I believe, who came up with this idea and started selling this tablet. And they came to the United States uh, with the, the movie Beauty and the Beast. Anybody ever see that? So Disney Studios uh, took a liking to these tablets and, you know, hey, why don't you come and build these tablets for us and, and help us? And so we built a site here in Portland. I think it was actually 
I wasn't at Whatcom at the time, but I think it was on this side of the river. Then it moved over to Vancouver for a long, long time. And then we moved back onto this side of the river four years ago, and we're just up the street. So if you just walk straight up Irving Street, you'll run right into us. And I invite everybody right now, we have this thing that we call the Experience Center, uh, where we have all of our products out on display for everybody to use, and you'll see us engineers come on down and we'll, we'll watch people, and we just watch. We, we try not to bother you or anything like that, but we wanna watch you interact with our products so that we can improve. And sometimes you get asked questions, sometimes you don't. But if you wanna play with all of our products, they're there, and you can tell us to leave you alone too. So, Wacom grew into this pretty good sized company and we're now worldwide. We have uh, a European division based in Dusseldorf. A uh, large programming staff is actually in Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, it's pronounced Froom, England, uh, where they do a lot of our, our signature stuff and I'll get into that in a minute. And then Portland where we write most of the applications that have to do with the tablet itself. So the device drivers on the Mac and the Windows, um, some of the setup programs, the control panels, yada, yada. It's, it's <coughs> fairly good complement of programs. Okay, who are our customers? Well, of course, the commercial artists are who made us, and they're kind of our bread and butter. And we're talking about you know line art guys that do simple things like the ads in the newspapers for the grocery stores. Um, they do the backdrops for games. They do storyboard layouts for movies. We have anime in Japan is a big deal. Uh, one of the large anime studios is one of our big customers. Um, you know, we don't do that here in the United States, but it's big over in Asia. Now, what most people don't know is air traffic controllers use us. You know, who would think that air traffic control, well apparently these air traffic controllers, they have these methods of how they know which plane is where and they write little notes to themselves. And so as, as a plane's flying in the air, they can click on the, the plane and then write some note and then close that little click and as the plane's flying around in the air, they can click on it again, get the information that they wrote. And each one of these air traffic controllers kind of has their own little note-taking method of how they keep track of who's where and who they need to talk to and who's getting close to each other, who's in the pattern to land. And I, when I came to Wacom, I never heard of that. Uh, but I was fascinated by it. There's a couple of good uh, videos out on YouTube, actually, of um, uh, Saab, uh, the aircraft company, and how they employ the Wacom tablets. And then, uh, forgive me, lady, but she gives a, a good uh, lecture about how there's actually a piece of software that the air traffic controllers themselves use. And that's who they sell, their customers are the air traffic controllers. But it's pretty fascinating, the application. Uh, we're big in emergency services, police, fire. And, you know, it used to be for a while, uh, cops would carry around a little keyboard on the, you know, built into their steering wheels and they they type all this information. Well, they got to where they were looking at their keyboards too much. So with a stylus and a, and a pad, they can mount that on, on the console in the middle and keep their head up. And so they can see where they're going and do what they do, draw their maps, say I need to go from this point to this point, it'll give them a route to go. And then financial institutions, our, our Froome outfit, uh, they studied how people sign their names with digital pens. And within that, there's all kinds of metric information that's unique to an individual. And so in Europe, the financial institutions are using these electronic signatures in a way that we're not really cottoning onto here in the United States yet, uh, but it's big in Korea, uh, and it's American banks actually, Citibank and stuff like that, overseas. And someday it'll catch on here. But the forensic analysis of that is kind of an interesting art all by itself. So how do these things work? Basically, here's a tablet, and there's a grid built into the bottom of this tablet. 
that emits radiation. And this pen is a receiver for that radiation. And I don't know if we're gonna get something up here or not. Yeah, well, we're in, uh, we're in slide mode. There we go. Um, but the pad emits a radiation, the pen captures that radiation, modifies it, and sends it back down to the pad. And then the pad sends it over to the computer and encapsulated in that information is how much pressure was applied to the tip of the pen, which one of the switches were pressed while they were doing it, was the pen upside down? And is the eraser what's actually touching the surface? Just all this information. And that's the basic gist of where our patented technology really comes from. And that's why Wacom uh, captured that, is we own that technology. How can it work if it's cordless and battery free? It's, it emit radiation. <clears throat> it's called electromagnetic resonance. And so we resonate a capacitor inside the tip of the pen that turns around and there's some intelligence inside the pen about what the state of the pen is and it ships it back on that very same frequency. So you must have a battery in the pen then. There's no battery in the pen. Is there a pen? Like an RFID, would it re-emit? Okay, so. It just reflects. <clears throat> okay, so the pen is cordless and battery free, but your tablet has, has to be connected to the computer. Yes, the tablet is powered. Oh, okay, I got confused. And we do make a, a line, a, a product line, where there is a battery in the pen. Um, it's primarily used by Samsung and the Galaxy Notes. So if you've ever noticed that, you know, you store the pen inside the, the chassis of the, the phone or the note, uh, it's actually charging when it's inside that little holder, and so when you take it out, it's fully charged. And you don't see people taking notes with those things for eight hours, so the, the battery lasts quite a while. Uh, our, our modern technology is 8,000 pressure levels. Um, it's kind of funny because in the drivers, we've always scaled whatever the process, uh, pressure number is from zero to 100%. So what percentage of fully down have you applied? And we would get technical support calls from people saying, well, I got the one with 8,000 pressure levels and the, the line isn't any thicker. And in fact, the line won't get thicker but there's a many, many finer points in between the thickness of the line. And that's what the 8,000 gets you. Uh, and these things are durable, right? I mean, they get dropped all the time. You don't want to throw them around because eventually there's a, a, a graphite core inside that if you hit it hard enough, it will break, but you got to hit it pretty hard to break it. Uh, our R&D pins, they, they have a pretty rough life and they still work. Uh, okay, this is the one for the, the batteries. Why would you want to use a battery in a pen? And, and the real answer that I kind of gave earlier is the, the technologies like the Note. It's small, okay, and you, and you don't have a whole lot of battery or power uh, available to build a sensor array that can emit inside a tele, or on a telephone screen. So it's, you share some of that power with the stylus, and it, it all works out, but it, it's smaller. There's fewer parts. Um, there's quite a bit of hardware inside the surface of the tablet to know exactly where the pen is and have information about uh, tilt. Right? You, can, you can tilt the pen this way or that way like a calligraphy pen, and, and you can have it widen or narrow the lines like a calligraphy pen. We have one pen where you can twist it, um, and we can pick up that twist, and so you can put like blades or brushes or something like that, so it would be like a paintbrush. Uh, there's all kinds of tricks you can use with this. Uh, most often, you, you see people using tilt more than anything. We even have one that has a little airbrush roller, so you turn the little dial like a mouse wheel, but it controls the volume of paint that's coming out on the screen. It's kind of kind of novel, and it works quite well. Okay, so who who do we sell some of this active technology to? 
and it really gets divided up into two worlds. And since Apple won't license the Mac OS to us, uh, we don't put the Mac OS on any of our tablets. But we do build display tablets that are full-blown Windows and Android machines that are Wacom branded products. Uh, and then we resell the technology to Dell, Fujitsu, uh, whoever. Uh, and we, we help them out. We have a group over here in Portland that helps those guys out with getting the drivers uh, set into their system with uh, their particular technologies and their needs. That's independent of the driver that we write for Windows or uh, the Mac OS. And for about three years, maybe four years now, we've been branching out into software products and, and instead of just being a hardware-only company. And some of this is stemming from um, some use models. We, we actually build the tablet that you put a piece of paper over the top of it and you use a, a pen that has ink in it. Okay. <laughs> Um, the pen has ink, and so you, you actually draw on the piece of paper, and, and the tablet is recording uh, that, <laughs> that whole sequence. So if you want to use a green pen, it knows you're using a green pen. Then you switch to a blue pen, it knows you're using a blue pen. And, and so you can make these drawings on paper, but then capture them uh, electronically so that if you want to modify it, sell it, do whatever you want to do, it's available. Uh, the signature thing, like I told you about the dynamics of the signatures. And there's a lot of interest in the industry from some of the, the larger companies about, okay, so how do you guys do this and, and what do we want to do? So we've come up with something called WILL, which is the standard, or the Wacom Inc. layer language, I think. They'll kill me if I'm wrong. Uh, but we, we're basically trying to, to help a consortium and or lead a consortium into standardizing how that kind of dynamic information gets stored for software. And then people can incorporate that software in their various products. And you can do things like uh, have some finer grained um, transportation between one system to the next rather than just these big bitmaps. You can actually have information about the stroke direction, the stroke pressure, the stroke angle, um, and it, it scales well, and it, again, it, it works with these signature guys pretty well. And then we're also big on the digital stationery. Okay, so there, you know, for years it was the printed piece of paper, and now it's the the digital world, right? The movies now are all digital, CGI is all digital. So how do you come up with some sort of standard? that allows you to move things from point A to point B, uh, from operating system A to operating system B, from application A to application B, and still have it look the same. And, and it's kind of, you know, what PostScript was back in the 80s, is what we're going for in the 90s, except for with pen strokes. And that's pretty much the presentation. I've got two tablets up here that I'd like to invite you guys up to play with. Uh, I have three pens. This guy is our thin line pen. Uh, I kind of like it. it. It seems to be a favorite amongst the engineers. Um, this one is a pen that's specifically built for the 3D marketplace. Uh, a lot of the animators like ZBrush and, and those guys, uh, we have the extra button for the extra 3D functions. And this one's kind of the old standby pen that, that's been around for a long, long time. And, and I actually, this is my favorite one. <laughs> but we each have our own, so I want you to try them all, figure out which one fits for you, and let me know if you like them or not. Yeah. I, I'm not sure everybody here realizes that your pads and pens work perfectly with Macs. They're plug and play. But you said earlier that uh, Apple won't sell you the operating system, so you can't develop some of the things you did for the Windows-based machines. But, but your tablets are plug-and-play with all Macs. I've for, used one for over 10 years with my Mac and Photoshop. So. Yeah, I, I'll get into a little history with you guys. My, my first 
experience with the Wacom tablet was in 1988 or 89. And I was working for Apple at the time. And there was a company called Go Technologies. Anybody ever hear of Go Technologies? They were the first guys that were trying to do handwriting recognition. And Apple took an interest in this and they sent me over there to find out what was going on. And we actually met at the Wacom offices that were in the Bay Area way back when. They have closed that office quite a, some time ago. But here we are in this little room uh, doing early handwriting recognition on a Wacom tablet. And I thought, man, that thing's so cool. Because I'd, I'd never seen a Wacom tablet until that day. And I'd used that old clunky IBM pen. And I was like, boy, you know, these guys are onto something here. After I, I uh, left Apple, I went to work for Adobe. And all the guys that were developing Illustrator and Photoshop, they all had their choice of whatever tablet they wanted to use. And so that you'd see inside their offices, you know, they'd have five or six different tablets, but it was always the Wacom that was on their desk. And, and so that's the one that they were using to do the development with. And so that caught my attention. And so when Wacom was like, oh, we need a Mac guy, I was like, ah, yeah, this is a good product. I can work on this product. And so many products nowadays, you, you can't. Uh, I, I went to Wacom from Intel where I actually worked on the original Intel base Max. And when they called me up and said, uh, hey, why don't you come do the Intel base Mac? Not quite so much after a few non-disclosure agreements and whatnot. Um, it was like, well, it's gonna be a cold day in hell when the Mac OS runs on an Intel chip. And then I thought about it for a, about a week and I said, you know what? If, if they're gonna do that, let's go in there and do our, our best and, and see if we can't get this thing to work. So I ended up over at Intel for seven years working on most of the Macs people were using them. And here I am, still, still there. So, questions? Ah, yes, thank you for bringing that up. I sat down and I started pulling down a bunch of artwork saying, oh, here's our current product line. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna direct you to Wacom.com. And, you know, they've got a full spread on what our products are. They have the artwork there. They tell you what niche marketplace they're in. Uh, and they tell you something I don't know, which is generally the price. I mean, we, we build them, we don't sell them, so we don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's the truth. Uh, but you can see where they're at. And, and quite frankly, um, I, I kind of like the site because they, they break it up into the, the high-end product, uh, the display products, the low-end products, the individual pins, and it does a pretty good job at, at explaining what it all does. So we can really come up and uh, play with it? Yeah, yeah. Let me, uh, I'll, you guys prefer Photoshop or Illustrator or is there a particular one you want to use? Should I? Yeah, probably. Okay, should I kill the recording, the screen recording? <coughs>